Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? It's so good to be back with you again. Um, yes. We missed last week, and I'm glad to see you even though it's raining today. So thank you for being here. We're going to get started with a prayer, as we always do, so let's bow our heads. Our Father who art in heaven, we come before your throne in the most humble way that we know. We're praising you for being the great and wonderful God that you are. We ask that you would be with us, that we would grow in grace and knowledge of your word and of your will. We thank you for your word that lets us know you and lets us know your will. We pray, God, that we would be spiritually minded as we know that this life is just temporal and that we are on a journey toward heaven. And we pray, God, that as we live our lives, we would do so honestly walking in the light that we might have the blood of Jesus continually cleanse us so that we can be with you in heaven. We thank you, God, for giving so freely your son to come to this earth. We thank you that the word so freely gave himself to come to this earth and indwell a human body and gave up so much even in his life as he lived and also in his death as he gave his body to hang on the cross. We thank you, God, for this sacrifice that we might be brought into a relationship with you and have a hope of living with you throughout eternity. We ask that you would be with us as we study today, that our study would bring us closer to you and would help us to be molded to be more like Jesus. And we pray for all who are studying this morning and all who will listen later to the lesson and study at a later time that you would bless us because of this time that we have put into studying your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are going to study Not By Human Wisdom, Happiness, Not By Human Wisdom, Part 2. All righty. Many today believe that ultimate happiness will be, will be found by devoting them, their lives to pursuing education and learning. That's the premise of this uh, study here. And we know that as Christians, that is not how we uh, receive true happiness. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17, please. Acts chapter 17 is where we will begin our study. Who can, off the top of their head, tell me what's going on in Acts chapter 17? Anybody? Paul at Thessalonica. Okay, Paul at Mars Hill. Paul at Mars Hill. He gives a sermon. And we're going to start with verse 16. Acts 17, beginning with verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now listen to this verse. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. 
Look with me. Okay, that's as far as we're going to go in that. But I want you to notice verse 21. What was their main focus in life? Copy. Education. Education. Gaining knowledge. Knowledge. And what did it lead to? It led to idolatry. They worshipped all these gods. They even had an idol to an unknown god. Did it give them what they needed in life? No, it did not because Paul had to teach them about the true God. Okay, so that's how I wanted to start our lesson because our lesson is about not finding true wisdom and happiness in secular, worldly wisdom, intelligence, learning, whatever. Okay, um, there are a couple of examples of secular wisdom in Jesus' day and time that would have led one away from realizing that Jesus was the true Messiah and Savior of the world. Uh, one of the things that our author mentioned was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That was a common thought during the time of Jesus. To be a Galilean was a term of highest reproach. The character of Nazareth was decidedly bad. Um, this is according to the commentary that I read. And so um, this was a common thought that nothing or no one good could come from Nazareth and Galilee. So turn with me to John chapter 1 verse 46 and we'll see where they do say of Jesus, can anything good come out of Galilee? John 1 verse 46. Miss Linda, read that loud and clear for us, please. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. All right. And now turn over to chapter 7 and look at verse 52. Chapter 7, verse 52. Miss Sammy, read that loud and clear for us, please. They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has ris arisen out of Galilee. Okay, so Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but then um, he had to, his family had to escape, and he went and dwelled in Galilee, and Galilee was where uh, he considered himself a Galilean. Galilee was where he considered his home, okay? So if they had listened to that idea, they would not have believed that Jesus was the true Savior because nothing good can come from that region. Um, turn with me, well, actually, look in chapter 7 and look at verse 15. Brenda, it's your turn to read. John 7, verse 15. The Jews then were astonished, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? All right. So another thought was that the Messiah would be an educated person. There were specific schools for the Jews to go to. You know, Paul talked about being uh, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. And so they didn't believe that the Messiah would be an uneducated man. They thought the Messiah would be you know, rich and wealthy and educated and a man of great honor and whatever. And so if they had believed this type of uh, knowledge that they got from their religious rulers, it would have pointed them away from Jesus. All right? Look with me now at Luke 4 and verse 22. Luke 4, verse 22. This was another misconception that was going around in Jesus' day. Um, Miss Joanne, it's your turn to read. Luke 4, 22. And all were speaking well of him and wondering all of the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this Joseph's son? 
Okay, here again, this kind of goes along with the educated part, but he spoke so well, but he was a common man. He was a common man. This was Joseph, the carpenter's son. Joseph, of course, was not his uh, true father. He was more his adoptive father, his earthly father. But if they had believed that the Savior was not going to be a common man, then it would have pointed them away from Jesus being the Savior because he was a common man. All right. Um, the next one we're going to look at is John 7, 27. John 7, 27. John 7, 27, Miss Linda. How be it we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Okay, so this is kind of confusing because back in the Old Testament, it was prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And if you turn over with me to Matthew chapter 1, no, actually Matthew chapter 2, I'm sorry, 1 through 5. We will read 2, 1 through 5. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. So he asked the chief priests and the scribes, where is the Messiah to be born? And what did they answer? In verse 5, they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. Verse 6, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. All right, so did they know where he was supposed to be born? Yes, yes they did. And they told Herod where he was to be born. So what does this mean that the Messiah, they would not know where he was from? Well, I looked that up also. And the common thought in those days was that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Then he would be taken away somewhere and hidden. And then he would be returned at one point, And there they would know that he was the Messiah. So therefore they, were not, they would not know where he had been hidden after he was born. Um, and if you would turn with me to Matthew 24, Jesus, I believe, alludes to this himself, this belief. Matthew 24. We're going to look at verse 23 through verse 26. I believe Jesus is alluding to this. Matthew 24, beginning with verse 23. Jesus says, Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. All right, here Jesus is speaking about the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says, don't believe these people that are saying, here this Jesus in the wilderness, or here he is here, or whatever, the Messiah. Because Jesus was warning his true followers that he was who he said he was. And I believe he's alluding to this common thought that they had during their day, that the Messiah's origins would be hidden. Okay, And so if they believed that, it would point them away from Jesus, wouldn't it? Does worldly wisdom a lot of times today point us to Jesus or away from Jesus? Here again, today, worldly wisdom most usually points us away from the truth and away from Jesus. 
The key to true happiness won't be found in secular education, but in knowledge of wisdom from knowledge and wisdom from God's word. Look at its importance. Um, if we go back into the Old Testament, we've all heard this quoted. Hosea 4, verse 6. Hosea 4, verse 6, was, which mentions, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They didn't have God's word. Therefore, they went and did what they wanted to do, and it destroyed them. Eventually, they were all led into captivity, and they had all kinds of bad things happen to them because they were not following God's word. They didn't have his word. Look at the letters that Peter writes in the New Testament. That was an Old Testament example. But let's look in the New Testament. We're going to look first at 1 Peter 2, verse 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. over there. Um, I believe it's your turn to read, Miss Sammy. First Peter 2, what verse? 2. Wait a minute, that's not right. It must be 2 Peter. Let me see. Or was I in chapter 1? No, 1 Peter 2 is right. I was in chapter 1. I was messed up. 1 oh, wow. Peter 2, 2. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Okay, so my translation says, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Peter says we are to long for the word. Like how? Like newborn babes wanting their milk. I have a very new great niece. And I have no doubt that when she's hungry, she lets her new mama know about it. She cries. And we know babies, they cry and cry and cry and cry until they get what they want or need. And Peter says we are to long for God's word and his knowledge like that. It should be an ache. It should be a hunger and a thirst in our lives. All right. Look with me now at um, 2 Peter. Did you know that the book of 2 Peter, this little letter, uh, I realized in one of my studies it begins with grow and it ends with grow. Okay, look specifically at verse 3. Brenda, I believe it's your turn to read. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So this says to us that we can have what? Everything we need. Everything has granted, been granted to us pertaining to life and godliness, everything. That means happiness is included, right? Everything, okay? And then if we go ahead and we look at verse 5 through verse 11, we'll see that Peter tells the people that he's writing to and also us today that we should continue to grow. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, beginning with... Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. And Sister Joanne, read verse 8 for us, please. For these things qualities are yours in heart increasing. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful. Okay. What did it say? If they're yours and they're what? Increasing. 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 Verse 9 through verse 11. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. 
Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. So see, he says, you need to have knowledge, you need to add all these graces, and you need to keep adding, keep growing these graces, keep growing this. So now, if you turn, that's the beginning of the, the letter. And remember I said it begins and ends with grow. So turn now to chapter 3 and look at verse 18. Miss Linda, it's your turn. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. What did it say? But grow. So put in your Bibles, if you're marking your Bible, 2 Peter begins and ends with growth. Growth, that's important. Grow in the knowledge of God. Okay. The basis of true knowledge. The basis of true knowledge is our next little part of this lesson and we're going to turn to Psalm 111 verse 10 Psalm 111 verse 10 Verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. So what is the basis of true knowledge? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Look with me now at Proverbs chapter 1. And verse 7. One, verse 7. Sammy, I believe it's your turn. The, <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise it. I think we can see that when we see the wisdom of the world. That fools it's foolish. The things that they spout out are foolish. They despise the wisdom and instruction from the Lord. All right. When one pursues human wisdom, such as the things that we mentioned last week. Last week we mentioned humanism. We mentioned postmodernism. We mentioned the new morality. All of these, when one pursues this human wisdom, he must first remove the awesome respect we must have for the Lord. In all of these humanism, postmodernism, all these isms, these wisdoms of the world, God has to be dethroned. In order for these thoughts, these uh, types of wisdom, these isms to work, they all dethrone God. They take away the awesomeness of Him. They take away His authority. They take away his right to tell us what to do. And we know that man cannot and will not be led to true happiness through listening to those worldly wisdoms. I want us to turn now to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. And I believe everybody probably knows verse 16 and 17. But we'll read them from the Bible, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Miss Joanne, it's your turn to read. 2 Timothy 3, 16. And 17. There you go. All scripture is inspired, inspired by God with improbable for teaching, for reproof, and 
for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All right, so that the man of God can have everything he needs. He will be fully, totally equipped for all good works, for everything he needs. It's in this scripture. Okay, look with me now at, uh, since we're in the New Testament, we'll turn to 2 Peter next. 2 Peter 1.3, we've already read this. Do you all remember what it said? 2 Peter 1.3. you read it again. 2 Peter 1 verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Remember reading that? Mm -hmm. His power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. All right, now we're going to go look in the Old Testament. We're going to go back to Psalms. Psalm 119. What is Psalm 119 the whole uh, chapter about? Psalm 119. What is the whole chapter of Psalm 119 about? It's about the Word of God. The Word of God and, and the psalmist's love for independence on the Word of God. Psalm 119, verse 130. I believe it's Miss Linda's turn to read. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Okay. So God's word gives us understanding. It lights our way. And I love this, that it says it gives understanding to the simple. Even the simple person can be wise if they store God's heart within, pardon me, God's word within their heart. Look with me now at Psalm 19. Psalm 19. I know we're doing a lot of flipping in our Bibles, but this class is all about Bible study, so it's good. And we're talking about learning God's Word, so it's good that we go to His Word for this. Psalm 19, we're going to look at verse 7 through verse 11. Um, I love this passage. Matter of fact, I have it written uh, in the white part of, of my Bible, you know, so that I can remember it. Psalm 19, 7 through 11. Um, Sister Brenda, it is your turn to read. So you read a couple verses, then Sister Joanne can read one or two, and then I'll finish it out. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Okay, stop right there. The precepts of the Lord are right in verse 8. What to the heart? Rejoicing. Rejoicing the heart. Is that what we're not talking about? We're talking about happiness. And he says the precepts, what's in God's word, brings happiness to our hearts. Verse 9 now, Sister Joanne. The fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, they much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. I love this passage because it shows to me what... God's word is and how it can affect me. And he says we are to desire, to desire God's word more than wealth or more than the sweetness of the honeycomb. God's word should be sweet to the Christian's life. And then I cannot help but think about 
how God's word and his instruction makes us happy without thinking about Psalm chapter 1. So if you'll turn with me, we will read Psalm chapter 1. Actually, it's just, I said chapter 1. That's a misnomer. It's just Psalm 1. <laughs> Uh, beginning with verse 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now we've heard through the years that another term for blessed in the Bible is happy. So we could say how happy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So here we see that the one who walks in the counsel of the world, the wicked, they're, they're, they don't have a shake, they have a shaky foundation to stand on. They're like the chaff which the wind blows away. But the Christian whose delight is in the law of the Lord, he has a firm foundation. The things that he does will prosper. Does this mean that Christians will never have anything bad happen to them? No, that's not what it means. Does it mean that everything we put our hand to do, it will prosper and turn out good? No, because none of us are perfect, are we? And we do make uh, errors in our judgment sometimes. And we do sin sometimes. But we know that Jesus' blood cleanses us from all of our sins and we can try again. And we also know that God is there for us to lean on. The sinner doesn't have anybody to lean on. He doesn't have God to lean on. He has other fallible men to lean on. And um, the delight we delight in the law of the Lord and will be firmly planted and will be able to blossom and grow and to have this happiness that we're all seeking for. There is a hidden danger in knowledge that Paul... Um, warns us of, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians, we'll see that. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is where we're going to start. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Miss Linda? Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. All right, so here is the warning that Paul gives us. He says knowledge can make us arrogant. It can puff us up. But he says love edifies. So when we have this knowledge of God's word and we're trying to teach it to other people, we have to do so in a gentle and loving way. Everything that we know should be and should be through love when we uh, speak it to other folks, when we try to teach them. It we should have the motive of love, not I know better, I'm smarter than you are, I've studied longer than you have, but it's no, I really want you to be in heaven with me. Can I show you what I have learned? in the scripture and so we have to do our teaching and have our knowledge with a sense of love first corinthians 13 and verse 4 is also a reminder that true love is not arrogant uh, sister sammy first corinthians 13 and verse 4 Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Okay. So love is not parading itself or bragging. It's not arrogant. It's not puffed up. If we truly love someone, we will not go to them with our knowledge in a haughty way, 
we will be very humble and we will try to share and our motive is love not to prove that you're wrong and I'm right but so that we can all draw closer to God and someday live with him in heaven and then finally I want us to look at James and we looked at James last week this same passage but finally let's look at James chapter 3 James chapter 3 verse 17 James chapter 3, verse 17. Does the wisdom that you're following today measure up to this verse? If it doesn't, then you know it's a false wisdom, and it is not going to bring you that happiness that you're looking for. James 3, verse 17. But the wisdom from above, that would be whose wisdom? God's, God's wisdom. Is first pure, then peaceable, let me ask you about the wisdom that we get from the world. Is it peaceable? No. It causes great it causes great unrest. It causes great uh, diversity in in thought. You know, we have you just look at the United States right now. We have this group of people who are more uh, liberal and who are following the wisdom of the world. We have this people group of people who are more conservative and they are just button heads big time can find no common ground the wisdom of the world is not peaceable okay verse 17 again first but the wisdom from the world uh, pardon me but the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable gentle gentle what about the wisdom of the world what about those people who believe uh, in all these isms that we talked about, that there's no, um, there is no tried and true truth. They, th they think there's no truth, that everything is just uh, what, you what you want it to be. One, your truth is yours and your truth is yours and there's no firm foundation and no real truth. Is that, is that gentle? A lot of times, if you disagree with them, they are, they are right in your face. They're right in your face. <laughs> They're rude or they may be violent. Uh, do you recall when we had one president elected not too terribly long ago and riots broke out in some of the cities? People were busting in windows of, of, of stores and looting and stuff. That's not peaceable, is it? Okay, so wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable. Reasonable could be um, you can discuss it. You can discuss it with reason. You can reason out with each other. You can discuss it and come to a conclusion. Many times, people who believe in uh, things that the world teaches, they're not reasonable. You can discuss it. You can show them truth. You can show it in the Bible even. And they just say, well, I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. So uh, some of you may have dealt with people who have Alzheimer's or dementia. And you cannot reason with those people. They're like little children. They cannot understand. They're even worse than little children. A little child you might can reason with a little bit. But these people, they, their brain has just shut down, and it's just, you just can't talk it over with them. They, they, they don't hear. And a lot of times these people who believe in this worldly wisdom are the same way. They just won't hear. The Bible speaks of people who close their ears. Their ears are dull of hearing. Okay, next, the wisdom from above is pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruit. Here again, if I say that homosexuality is wrong, then I get accused of being homophobic. I get accused of hating those people. Is that full of mercy? That's not full of mercy, is it? Is God's word full of mercy? God says these things are wrong, but if you quit them, if you repent of them, I will forgive you. I won't hold that against you. But this worldly wisdom is not full of mercy and full of good fruits. 
full of good fruits. What do we see from the wisdom of the world? We see unhappiness, don't we? The hedonist who says live life to its fullest, go out and drink, party, have a good time. We see wrecked homes from that. We see poverty from that. We see uh, violence, murder, uh, manslaughter, you know, driving drunk or whatever. We see all kinds of bad fruits from that. God's Word produces good fruit because God's Word says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, then we're going to treat people the right way. And it's going to produce good fruit. And then finally, God's wisdom from above is unwavering. When we look at God's Word, we can trust it. God's Word will last through eternity. We can trust it. If we read it here, we don't have to wonder if it's true or not. Our responsibility is reading and studying so that we know that we are understanding it correctly and applying it correctly in our lives. And God's Word is without hypocrisy. It's not say one thing, teach one thing, and act another way, is it? It calls on those of us who, who read it and teach it to live it in our lives. And so when you put human wisdom to the test of this verse, you can see that it is not going to bring happiness because it's not true. It's not true. So that is our class for today. The next time we meet, we'll uh, study that happiness does not come by pleasure. In your book, that's what the title is. Happiness does not come by pleasure.